thank you so thank you very much for the invitation and, and for writing the, the great book i was very happy to see a book like this published and uh, very happy to be here so my initial thoughts were to critique the book on some of its more minute details i was thinking maybe of responding to this idea of primary matter, which I'm not super, uh, super keen on. But instead, I thought it actually, we share so much in common throughout the philosophical bits of this book that it would be kind of a disservice to come here and give uh, this little critique. And I thought what I'd do instead is to, having, having got the author's blessing, is to look at a central area of the book's discussion, especially in chapters one through three, and um, that I have some expertise and opinions on, uh, and that's not the theology bits, I'm sorry to say, but the more scientific and philosophical bits about teleology and causation and contemporary evolutionary developmental biology. And some of the things I am going to say are kind of uh, bigger picture maybe, or more philosophical views that sort of mirror the things that we heard in the last talk. Um, and I hope that this talk is seen as a kind of endorsement and an exploration of some of the central themes of Morris's book, uh, especially those in, in chapters one through three. So this book sets up a kind of useful dichotomy, I think, when discussing teleology and, and biology, and especially evolution. And, and um, you know, it says that the contemporary debate on the mechanism of biological evolution resembles the ancient struggle between Empedocles, who would understand evolution as an entirely random process of coming to be of new organisms without any per se or final <coughs> causes, and Aristotle, who when observing and describing changes in nature would always refer to final and formal causation. And in particular, the book makes this claim about Aristotelian teleology being central to contemporary biology. So uh, it says goal directness must be taken into account in the study of the ordered nature of organisms Teleology cannot be ignored in the developmental process. And of course, due to the interrelatedness of these processes, it also becomes indispensable for our understanding of evolution. The book also highlights the distinctness of the Aristotelian view of formal or potentialities in biological systems in contrast to the sort of atomistic and mechanistic view of organisms. So, uh, it says, despite its rejection by many followers of the contemporary version of atomism, the Aristotelian Thomistic theory seems to offer a powerful and plausible argument against the Democritian view of matter, right? So when describing what a substantial form is, Mario says it's a simple metaphysical principle, not a thing that does not have the property of quantity or extension. And I think this is rightly pointed out. It's a very common misunderstanding in contemporary Aristotelian metaphysics that I'm very pleased to see the book staunchly avoid that substantial forms are more akin to metaphysical principles and are not things, right? So whatever teleological or formal causation ends up being, uh, it doesn't operate at all like our classic billiard balls colliding on Hume's table, right? So these big emphases of the book, this notion of teleolo teolo teleology being uh, extremely important in our understanding of developmental biology and evolutionary biology, and this idea that that kind of teleology <coughs> might not be, might represent a kind of causation that we are not familiar with or that is uh, unfamiliar to the practicing biologist, uh, those sort of inspired me to, to give a talk that touches on both those themes, to try to kind of flesh that out in a way. We've heard a little bit about this more holistic, maybe non-atomistic view from the previous talk. Um, but what I want to talk about is how kind defining maybe Aristotelian forms, these holistic, non-mechanistic causes, namely powers or dispositions, have an important role to play in evolutionary explanations. So in order to do that, in the first part of this talk, I want to way, lay out some ways in which the mechanistic metaphysics that arose in the scientific revolution influenced what's known as the modern synthesis view of evolution and its consequences on the question of form, formal causation, and natural kinds in biology. So this is touched on um, briefly in chapter two as a way of introducing a debate on species concepts. It says, you know, it was a common sense consequence of the commitment to mechanism encouraged by the scientific revolution that this notion of species, uh, the classic sort of Aristotelian view, fell out of favor. So I wanted to here delve into this in more detail, taking a philosophical look at this shift in scientific thinking. <coughs> 
So the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries delivered new conceptual frameworks for understanding a large class of physical phenomena. And of particular importance was the reconceptualization of what causation consists in. Right? So the causal concepts of the Aristotelian science of the schoolmen, powers, and goal-directedness, or teleology, were seen as lacking explanatory power. And in the context of the scientific revolution, the explanation of a system's activities were seen as requiring a quantitative rather than a qualitative analysis of its composition. In other words, these analyses reveal that natural systems aren't guided by intrinsic principles of motion, but rather by external extrinsic forces. In other words, rejecting Aristotelian causes in natural phenomenon went hand in hand with discovering what might broadly be called mechanistic explanations for these phenomena. And importantly, these new causal resources brought with them a new particular metaphysics for the, the world of mechanisms, as we might understand it, is fundamentally extrinsic, passive, and accidental. Uh, and we heard a little bit about this in the, in the previous talk, but that's because in short, if you're thinking about it sort of philosophically, the elements of mechanisms are sort of passive participants in the production of effects whose activities are fundamentally extrinsically determined by the combination of natural laws and external contingent circumstances. So things are being pushed and pulled, their intrinsic natures aren't being brought into the, into the picture, they are just a cog in a wheel moving along to the operation of some mechanism, the final operation of which they are not directly involved with. So this is a metaphysics which explicitly rejects the Aristotelian view, activity, Intrinsic activity is now passivity and internal production, the idea that something in and of itself is responsible causally for its own nature is now merely external continuation, right? One ball hits it, the next, why does it move? Well, because it was just hit. Why does this one move? Because the next one was just hit, right? You lose this Aristotelian flavor. The biological sciences, however, were largely shielded from the scientific revolution as a, as a quote, special science. And that's largely because the phenomenon of organismal development still seemed best explicable by intrinsic, active, and non-accidental forces. So to take a look, a couple of them, right? The, the phenomenon of reproductive fidelity that an organism and its progeny were morphologically alike seemed a result of intrinsic shaping forces, right? It wasn't possible, we thought, to explain this uh, idea that progeny resembled their parents, or the specialized suitability of organs, right? The harmony between organismal morphology and lifestyle and environment. That seemed very goal-directed. This thing was built to operate in this environment. And in general, biology, at least then, remained a kind of Aristotelian science. Organisms were understood as having an intrinsic principle of activity which non-accidentally shaped their features. So. This idea from Aristotle that the non-random or the for something's sake, thinking teleologically, is present in the works of nature most of all, well, that stayed around for quite some time. Uh, but during and after the mechanistic enterprise of the scientific revolution, organisms were still seen as having forms or teleologically rich causal structures, which classified them as belonging to different natural kinds. And getting rid of formal causes, in, 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 at least in the biological science, was seen as a kind of insurmountable task. Uh, why is that? Because there were no clear mechanistic models which could capture the goal-directed morphogenesis of organisms and no obvious laws of nature that are quite general that, what, that might produce them, right? And this is why anti-mechanistic theories of organisms like vitalism remained <coughs> quite viable <coughs> even during that time. But with the advent of evolutionary theory, another revolution took place, this time in the biological realm, also touched upon in chapter two. Uh, the discovery of new mechanisms suggested new causes. The combination of deep time, phenotypic variation, and selection looked able to explain the relevant features of organismal morphology. Of course, after the molecular structure of <coughs> DNA was discovered, everything changed. And what's known as the modern synthesis, the combination of genomic cataloging and statistical analysis offered new explanations of organismal development and morphology. And evolution can now be understood as change in gene frequencies over time. And the morphologies of individual organisms could be explained by particular changes in populational trends, drift, flow, et cetera, right? 
According to the modern synthesis, then, this post-genomic idea about evolution, organismal morphology is nothing more than the adaptive byproduct of evolutionary mechanisms. Thus, natural kinds, if there are any, must be understood as passively and extrinsically molded by accidental forces. In other words, in the modern synthesis, natural kinds and their associated developmental phenomena can now be conceptualized in a mechanistic metaphysics, right? They are pushed and pulled by the predominant pressures within their respective populations, their environment, their broadly environmental pressures. So does adopting the explanatory structure of the modern synthesis require one to bid farewell to form? Well, evolutionary theory doesn't have ontological import per se, but we can see the modern synthesis supposition of mechanistic metaphysics from where it places explanatory weight. Right? It explains organismal form by change mechanisms, which are all extrinsic and accidental forces acting on passive, fundamentally passive organisms. Thus, the goal-directedness and the stability of form is simply not in its explanatory remit. Stability doesn't involve changes in gene frequencies and hence is not really amenable to the sort of explanations you might find in the modern synthesis. But then how do we explain the stability of organismal features over phy phylogenetic timescales, the so-called unity of type? We saw the tetrapod limb earlier, but in instance, for instance, in cases of homologs where structural similarities persist across long reaches of time and across species boundaries, right, as we saw in the, in the previous talk. Here, the, the bone structure of the tetrapod limb from whales and frogs to humans and horses and bats, can this stability of morphology and apparent directionality of development be fundamentally the result of extrinsic and merely accidental forces? Well, as we know, common descent and some passing on of trait building mechanisms can explain some features of stability and directed development. But there are other interesting cases involving morphological restriction and directed development that these factors seemingly don't explain. For instance, the limited available number of forum shape shells on the left, right? One could imagine many more shape possibilities, but the possibilities here are in fact the only possible shapes. The space of possibilities is interestingly restricted or limited. Same thing we saw uh, in the previous talk about the restriction based on physiochemical factors. Is this an extrinsic and accidental affair? Or to take a more fun example, uh, the fact that while there are over 8,000 species of centipede and an observed wide variation in body segments from numbers 9 to 199, there are always an odd number of segments. Despite their namesake, there are no 100-legged centipedes. Uh, is this something extrinsically and accidentally determined? In the, the science of Evo Diva, the new science that's come after the modern synthesis, the idea that organismal morphology is determined only by extrinsic factors and solely by chance is being questioned. In Evo Devo studies, as part of the extended evolutionary synthesis we heard about in the previous talk, have suggested that the, trajectory, the evolutionary trajectories of organisms have a privileged directionality. Or to put it another way, that morphological space, the possibilities of organismal form, is more restricted than perhaps the modern synthesis of philosophy of biology initially supposed. Indeed, according to Evo Devo, organisms themselves shape the possible playing field of and constrain the probability of the direction of selection itself. In other words, the modality of morphology is grounded in the generative architecture of organisms instead of outside it. There are, there are intrinsic developmental constraints which delimit morphological space. Take a look at our, our shells and our centipedes. They rule out some morphologies, right? They say those things aren't possible, and it's not because of an ac outside accidental force, but instead due to something about the intrinsic nature of the organism. And this developmental architecture defines morphological space. They establish what is morphologically possible, and among those possibilities, which are more probable, furnishing organisms with a particularized degree of evolvability, which features, which features and which forms 
of those features are available and optimal for selection. So instead of talking about what happened and taking a log book of the, of the changes in evolution, we see that this new understanding is trying to look at organisms themselves and see from their generative architecture which forms they could make and which are more probable that they make. That lays out the playing field for selection to then act on. Right? You need that initial step. And taken together, these claims entail that the course of evolution isn't wholly extrinsic or accidental, and that organisms aren't wholly passive in that process. As, as Mueller says, Evo Devo moves the focus of evolutionary explanation from the external and the contingent to the internal and the inherent. So from the perspective of sort of contemporary Evo Devo, the morphological features that typify things like natural pines are not merely frozen accidents, but really they're reflections of centers of power and modality. That is, from an Evo Devo perspective, organisms have an intrinsic, active, non-accidental nature which shape their morphological development and therefore guide in some way the course of evolution. So as we've seen, one's ontological commitments can vary greatly depending on where one places explanatory weight in the process of evolution. And what I want to suggest is that the explanatory structure of, of Evo Devo suggests that the formal features of organisms, and we'll say more about that in a minute, are not as explanatorily impotent as the modern synthesis and early evolutionary theory and its mechanistic metaphysics might have supposed. Right? And the pertinent question for us is, if we have new explanatory resources, right, might they map onto new causes? If Evo Devo is appealing to intrinsic, active, and non-accidental features of organisms to explain development and evolution, might form, and so, and so causal powers feature into the causal picture? And if so, might form more appropriately feature in some non-mechanistic framework? So I want to suggest that this is, in fact, the case. And although, as, as Mario says here, the, the success of molecular and cell biology, biochemistry, and genetics inspired not only the reductionist program of logical positivism, but also some reductionist interpretations of evolutionary theory. Of course it did. Uh, we should also note, as he, as he continues, this reductionist and anti-teleological view of biological evolution is highly problematic and inconsistent. And has, that, that fact has become evident for many. Uh, I am one of those many, and what I want to illustrate is that capturing the nature of organisms, according to Evo Devo, might require new explanatory models, and those models themselves may indicate the existence of one of the central themes of these early chapters, and that is forms and formal causation. And that's because to explain the phenomenon of interest in Evo Devo, things like the unity of type, as we saw in the homologue case, or phylogenetic pathing, where convergence and divergence of evolutionary histories talked about a little bit in the last talk as well, Evo Devo conceptualizes organisms as centers of power and modality. It appeals to these dual features of evolvability, the ability of organisms' internal gen uh, generative architecture to develop forms that are there for selection, and <coughs> developmental constraint, the idea that there are some things that just can't be made from a set of uh, generative architecture inside an organism, as we've already seen. So can we explain those phenomena and capture those features by appealing to mechanisms? Well, mechanistic explanation essentially involves breaking systems down into compositionally discrete collections of entities and activities and tracing linear uh, causal trajectories through them to some productive endpoint. Mechanistic explanation, this more atomistic explanation, is prevalent in biology, of course, and especially in models that explain organismal development. Uh, we saw an example of this earlier, but genetic regulatory networks are a prime example. They map the group of genes in a single module responsible for building a particular morphological feature. Elements of that model produce proteins for building traits and proteins for controlling the activity of other elements within the model. They're typically directed acyclical graphs, which obey Boolean logic operators, and they look something like this. Um, but they are, of course, that, that's a very toy example. They're much more complicated. They, they look really more like this. Um, 
But in fact, this is actually a massive simplification. This is closer. Um, and, and as messy as that looks, uh, it could be worse, right, if you, if you really want to get in. So the problem with these mechanistic models from an evo-devo perspective is not just that they don't make the causal structure of development perspicuous, which they very clearly don't, uh, but that their fine-grainedness makes them unable to represent system-wide causal structure. In other words, evo-devo explanations, which sort of already mentioned, require different models and a different perspective on the phenomenon of development because those explanations appeal to dynamical trends in system-level structure. So we've already seen a kind of holism with respect to morphogenic fields. This is a, a different kind of holism. We're now looking at the, the whole organism. And, and one way we could model this is by taking a more comprehensive systems level approach where we model development as a succession of whole organism cell states, right? If we use the logic of genetic regulatory networks, we take those confusing maps and we try to understand what it's doing at a system level, we see we can model what happens to which cells, where and when over time. We can see an organism progressing from certain cells expressed only there. They move causal relations left and right. You start to get differentiation over time, right? But if we want to understand this system level causal structure, we need an even wider perspective, one which captures the full intrinsic generative potential which grounds their evolvability, right? The sort of potentiality that's displayed in the intrinsic capability for specified phenotypic variation. Displayed, for instance, in the phenomenon which we heard about in the last talk of phenotypic plasticity, where broadly environmental signaling results in morphological alterations of size, shape, color, et cetera, right? Here, the radically different um, termite morphologies that, that exhibit the large repertoire of possible forms that are generable from a single system, right? So how do we represent on a big picture scale and understand the potential of an organism to produce all these different forms from the same set of generative architecture in the genome. Um, one way that I really like, I think is an interesting way to do this is to use the tools of dynamical systems theories to map these, these system potentialities. And the way this is done is by constructing an abstract multi-dimensional state space wherein each point represents a complete cell state mapping. And the idea is we can see the wider, more complete picture and model development as a temporal traversal across this space like so. So for instance, the developmental path from larva to worker ant is seen as, re as traveling through this space. Each point in that space represents a different possible configuration of the cell states in that system, right? So we could see typically what happens from the larva to the worker ant is it travels along this path. These sorts of cells are expressed. These sort of genes are expressed. And you can see the development of the organism through that path. All the possible, all the possible states are represented, but it only goes through one of those trajectories, right? And of course, there may be lots of possible paths here, but not every possible path is a probable path. Right? There are typical probable paths through these spaces which represent particular morphological end states. In fact, if we track the probabilities here, we can add another dimension to our model. If we illustrate the more probable with the heavier or lower regions of that state space, we discover that the system has a kind of topology. And our models now represent the system trend toward a particular morphology. So you can think about the process of development as a ball rolling on this abstracted surface, right? It's more likely if you start up there at the top of the hill in development, you're going to roll down towards this morphology at the bottom, right? It shows you that what's more probable is that the organism develops in such and such ways, right? But of course, this is only a single morphology, and we know that there are multiple morphologies, an entire morphospace, as we saw with the termite and phenotypic plasticity. So our models really look more like this, which are, of course, still simplifications, right? There's, there's two different kinds of ants. You could have the, the worker ant or the queen bee or something, of course. But then thinking about just our termite case, but the cases are inexhaustible from, from nature, development really looks like a kind of mountainous region where there's all sorts of different obstacles towards developmental paths, but there are privileged developmental paths that are more probable to come about. 
And what's important is that these topological models of morphous space, what they do, I think, is properly represent the whole system dynamics for generating morphologies. In other words, they give you a holistic picture of what's going on in the nature of an organism itself. In fact, these system level, this system level causal structure doesn't appeal, you'll notice, to the entities and activities of mechanisms. So I haven't appealed to the, side, the causal structure or lack thereof in genetic regulatory network diagram. In fact, it's a kind of holistic structure of the dynamic flow of the system. And importantly for us, they capture a directed structure, which models developmentally privileged end states or trajectories. They show that there are some things, some end state, in states that are more likely than others. And they exhibit, and this is important, two characteristic marks of directed systems. In other words, they give us some examples of teleology actually in the developmental architecture of organisms, right? They exhibit pleonasy, so they, they show the bringing about of an end state via a number of alternative pathways. If you started the ball of development over here because you've chemically altered the worker, you know, the, the ant larva in the lab, you start it over there, but guess what? It still ends up in its uh, worker ant form, right? That's represented there by the width of that valley, right? So you could start it anywhere you want and it still kind of tends toward the same developmental end state. But they also show persistence, right? That's the maintenance of an end state through alterations of dynamical variables, which we heard about from the last talk with respect to robustness, right? Represented by the kind of difficulty of escape from that basin. So once you are in that developed landscape, you can now change up some of your uh, genetic expression and you find yourself back at that end state that you started at. So importantly, in Evo Devo, these non-mechanistic or teleological system level features are doing some explanatory work. What they explain is the modality of morphology. They explain the resistance to evolutionary change of morphology with respect to developmental constraint. They say, well, it'd be nice if I could develop five more arms, but every time I try, I can't manage to do it, right? No matter what, no matter how I tinker, I can't do it. Therefore, evolution couldn't act on, a, on an organism which uh, had five arms because it's not there for selection, right? They model these important evolutionary phenomena of robustness and canalization. So we heard about robustness, but canalization is the kind of, it gets entrenched and that becomes uh, probably written into the genome itself. But they also explain the potential for the specified variation of form via evolvability, right? So they model the important developmental phenomena of a phenotypic repertoire, like all the possible ways an organism might develop, and of course the optimal exploration thereof. So once we have a set of possible morphologies, we can see which ones are more likely and which are not. So the system level morphospaces capture this intrinsic and active ground of organism morphology. They model developmentally teleological causal system activity. Right? So in a way, they capture form or the formal features of organisms. That's the question. Uh, but the question remains, although this causal structure is represented in these models, do they license ascriptions of novel forms of causation, that is, formal causation? This is an important question for us because these models are interesting. They show us a wider sort of meta perspective on the nature of organisms, and we have something here that's non-mechanistic, that's non-grounded in a kind of uh, atomistic view of chopping up nature's, the nature of organisms, maybe particularly by genes, even by particular cell modules, but do we have something here worthy of the term of formal causation? And formal causation is, of course, an important part of uh, any Aristotelian view and also a, a Thomistic view, I, I take it. Uh, well, what is formal causation? Um, in the book, I couldn't find a, 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 a very detailed explanation. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have a, a great grip on it either, but. For Aristotle, causation was, ex was inextricably tied to explanation, and that's the first thing we should say, uh, which, which is stressed in the book. And so formal explanations are usually via kind essence, so the kind of the definitional what it is to be of an organism, right? But importantly for Aristotle, definitions involve teleology, 
and the definitional and the dynamical are somehow aligned. At least that's my view on Aristotle. And I think this is something neatly uh, and, and sort of rightly summarized in the book. It says, the category of formal cause defined as a metaphysical principle for providing identity, right? It's got that, that notion of identity and the active and passive dispositions of a given entity, right? So this idea of a formal cause as providing both the identity of something and giving you, and also somehow providing the active and passive dispositions of a thing, if that's our idea of what a formal cause is, then we have something to work with. Uh, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. So for Aristotle, the teleological explanations are involved in processes which happen always or for the most part, and if nothing else, interfere. So he gives these great examples of spider webs and seeds and teeth in, in the physics, uh, not in the generation of animals, in the, in the physics. But anyway, these processes are most apparent in modality and the directedness of development. So, uh, you know, in general sense, uh, organisms, unlike more material elements, according to Aristotle, have specified developmental limitations, right? He says, for the growth of fire is unlimited while there is something to be burnt, but in all things which are naturally constituted, there is a limit and a logos both for size and for growth, and these belong to the soul, but not to the fire and to form rather than matter. And thinking more specifically, organisms also have particularized developmental trajectories, right? He says, because man is such and such, the process of development is necessarily such as it is, and therefore this part is formed first, that next. If, you, if you're that vague, you know, you can, <laughs> but it's still, it's a general, general principle, right? And, and after like fashion, we should explain the generation of all other works of nature. So there's this idea here that defining an organism, somehow giving its definition, does have these dynamical consequences. There's something about the form that tells you something about how an organism develops and the, the limits and the possibility of those limits from its definitional uh, aspect. So if you take the definition of a kind or maybe just an organism as captured by the sort of morphospaces, the sort of high level abstractions we've looked at, if that's an indicator of form or if it's somehow representing form being played out within an individual organism, if that's the definition that this interplay between the definition, the, the logos of the essence, and the dynamics, the specification of developmental dispositions, becomes quite clear in a way, right? We get dispositions for development for the typical features and the modality of these features, which are grounded in dynamics, those captured in those topological mappings of causal system structure, right? For development, we get typical features and their size, shape, et cetera, and the modalities of those variables how probable they are. And in dynamics, we get the topological mapping of causal wide system structure. So we can sort of see how invoking kind membership might be elucidatory with respect to the modality of morphology and therefore ex provide some explanatory insight with respect to evolution via developmental constraint and evolvability, etc. right? In fact, an Evo Devo properly explaining morphological evolution seems to require conceptualizing organisms as centers of activity and modality, this move to the intrinsic and the inherent, and defining kind by a non-mechanistic or dynamic profiles. Again, seen in one instance as the shift to morphogenic fields being more important than the, the gene-centered uh, view. Um, so is this kind membership, citing a kind membership, we've seen it can give us sort of developmental modalities because the definition of something is kind of bound up in the modalities it possesses. Uh, but is this formal causation? Is this tantamount to the form of an organism causing it to possess certain properties? Well, that depends by what you mean by cause. Uh, and the general consensus is no. So let's take a look at what genuine causation is supposed to consist in in mechanism so we can assess the strange nature of formal causation, whatever that's supposed to be. Uh, why is the general consensus no? Uh, well, with all that's been said until now, one might still say something like, granted, if we define kinds this way, we can invoke their definitions that are given by these system level properties to explain their possession of developmental dispositions. 
and thus explain some evolutionary facts about the groups of organisms which belong to this time, their certain lineages and the trajectories they've gone on. But where's the formal causation? Right? I've given you, you've explained some, you've done some explanatory work, but where's the, the metaphysical work? And this is something that, you know, as Lewis and, Lewis and Armstrong might have asked, where's, where's the biff? I don't know if that reference is too old now. There's this, uh, <laughs> this idea about uh, where's the actual oomph in causation, right? You've given me some, some notion of explanation, but not some notion of real, genuine causation. I take it there are, there are sort of two questions one might be asking here, right? The first one is, what's sort of causal about that formal structure of morphospace that I pointed out earlier? What's causal about showing that structure? Am I, sh am I really pointing to a cause there? The other one might be, what's causal about essence entailment? This is certainly something that a lot of commentators of Aristotle in the contemporary age have gone against. Um, but let's take the first one first. Is there causation in those dynamical systems structure? Is, is, is topological cause structure really causal structure? Do the wide attractor basins of those topologies cause robustness? Do its steep slopes really direct development? I mean, from the mechanistic perspective, the answer is no, right? Because without entities, without separable, discrete entities, we have no proper causal relator, uh, causal relationship that happens between A and B. And without activities, we have no proper causal relations, no particular connection between those. This holistic model just doesn't have that in its remit. So from the mechanistic perspective, you might think that these models are purely descriptive, so-called phenomenal models. And of course, predictive prowess doesn't straightforwardly entail causality. Right? It might be a very good model at predicting something, but not actually map on to causation. In general, the complaint is typically that these sort of formal models only track the symptoms, so-called, of causation, because they fail to invoke the proper sort of causality. And in this context, the distinction is often made between difference making and production, these two different accounts of what causation can be following, uh, following Hull. And uh, difference making is seen as conceptual, counterfactual based analyses. If this happened, then this would happen, or this happened because this happened, often regarded as kind of bookkeeping. Whereas production or process accounts of causation are seen as empirical, activity-based analyses which capture the real oomph of causation, right? There, that's, that's the proper account of cause. The other one just tells us something, something about causes, tracking the causes, it's bookkeeping. Um, formal causation might just be mere difference making and mechanistic causation might be capturing the more process or production idea. So the idea is that if we have this notion of formal causation, it's really just capturing this other kind of cause. It's not giving us the kind of cause that we're interested in in the empirical sciences. So as I said, mechanisms are often associated with productive accounts of causation. They're taken to reveal something deeper about causation. You wanna know what causation really is? Let's go down to the mechanisms at, at that level. You often see pronouncements like, I do not agree that this difference making, this first kind of causation, is itself the fundamental causal relation. What is fundamental is the web of causal influence. Uh, but what, what's in this web? Well, it's those facts, whatever they may be, that are deemed causal by a correct empirical analysis of causation. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's probably true, uh, but, but, but fairly uninformative. Un uninformative. And more detailed descriptions aren't really helpful either, right? What, what is a process? It's a physical four-dimensional entity that has some distinguishing feature which makes it apt to be a means by which causal influence can be propagated. Okay, some distinguishing feature. And what does it mean to produce something? Well, it's a change in a property of one part <coughs> dynamically producing a change in a property of another part. Okay, so <laughs> these descriptions and the problem with these descriptions is um, some of them they're uh, very obscure and some of them they repeat themselves. But the problem is that they think they're appealing to some different notion of causation that isn't captured by what might be captured by formal causation and claiming it as the more genuine kind. But when we look deeper, you don't see any genuine form of causation there, at least I don't think so. Uh, sometimes mechanists appeal to like 
these descriptions that Anselm once gave of causal productions as capturing causal unum. She says things like, you know, the real causal verbs are things like, um, well, if you look at like trans transcription of, of DNA, right? It's about binding, bubbling, unwinding is ing, is gerundes. They, they really capture a causal relation, right? But when we take a closer look at these sort of mechanisms, I think we have to ask ourselves, do those colorful descriptions do anything other than disguise difference making relations? They tell us that if we were to alter this, it would cause a corresponding change in that. They give us a counterfactual relationship that looks a lot less like the productive accounts and more like our earlier formal accounts. And for my money, it's difficult to see how production or process accounts can avoid bottoming out in difference making, right? There are philosophers who have held that the production or process accounts need counterfactual analyses and philosophers who have given counterfactual based analyses of mechanisms, right? But if counterfactual dependence, this if then or that, or that wouldn't have happened except for this, if that's the mark of causality, at least the only one, the best or the most fundamental one we have, then the models that we have been looking at, the counterfactual mapping of state transitions based on dependence relations, those Boolean networks underpinning them, they're just counterfactual maps. That whole landscape just looks like a big counterfactual mapping. It tells you the course of development, all, how the course of development goes, not only how it goes, but how it might go, which again has that knock-on effect in the process of evolution. And if essence entailments are counterfactual claims of a certain, certain sort, I mean, you can construe them counterfactually. If an organism were to belong to kind K, it would develop in certain ways, right? Especially given that conception we've looked at earlier. Well, then we have a sort of mark of causality that's already happening in the kind definition. In other words, if causation ultimately bottoms out in counterfactual dependence or difference making, right? Although one might still have questions about the nature of causation generally, formal causation is no more mysterious than whatever oomph is supposed to be, the, the bit, whatever that is, and it's no more miraculous than difference making, right? It's, if, if formal causation is esoteric, then so really is efficient causation, the kind of causation that's enshrined in this mechanistic idea and the only kind of causation that's allowed once we get rid of the, the proper Aristotelian categories of causation. So causation by a form, at least the way I've construed it here, I want to suggest is just as causal, or maybe is at least as causal, as the well-respected mechanistic causation, whatever that is supposed to be. And given that I think important evolutionary explanations, especially in Evo Devo, with respect to the modality of morphology, this idea of evolvability and developmental constraint, which itself shapes and, court and uh, guides the course of evolution, appeal to these formal features, then the study of organisms and their evolution might be understood really as a science of form and a return to looking at the form, a holistic, principle of activity which gives you active and passive dispositions in this case for development might need to come back into view. And I hope this talk has sort of expanded and enriched this idea a little bit that Marius just summarizes in his book. He says, Aristotle's philosophy of nature reminds us that we need to take formal and final causality into account in our attempt to explain the nature of evolutionary change. And I hope in doing so, it's illustrated that uh, sort of big project in chapters one through three of the book to be taken seriously both metaphysically and empirically. Thanks very much.